Would you stand, please? Would you be seated, please? Let me welcome you today to the Celebration of Life service for Dow D. Daddy Coleman. On behalf of the family, I welcome you. We thank you for being here to support this family and to honor the memory of this good man. We'll join together and sing with Brother Woody. And I can think of no better way to begin a service that honors a good man than to join our voices together and praise his God. So we'll sing together one of those songs that is, means so much to so many. For it says, How Great Thou Art. Would you stand and let's sing it together. Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. That God his Son not sparing Sent him to die I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, 
Lord, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. seated. Dal Daddy Coleman of Jasper, Texas, born May the 11th 1932 in Caldwell, Texas, passed from this earth on December the 11th, 2022 in Beaumont, Texas, though a resident of Jasper. He was 90 years and seven months. Dow was born in Caldwell, Texas to Earl and Malady Coleman. He grew up in Huntsville and enlisted in the United States Army where he served for two years In 1963, Dow moved to Jasper and began a legacy that many remember to this day. He served Jasper Independent School District for 54 years. He was a coach, a teacher, an assistant principal, the Jasper Middle School principal, and the Jasper High School principal. After retiring as Jasper High School principal, he returned to the district as a truant officer. Hope he didn't have to catch any of you. Dow made lasting friendships during his time at Jasper ISD and was well respected for his work and dedication. He was also very proud of his yard. He spent lots of time on his zero turn lawnmower, never taught Maureen how to do it, making sure that his yard always looked at its best. He loved his family. He loved time spent with them, especially when they could spend time at the beach house. He leaves behind a family that knew they were loved by him unconditionally. He survived by his wife of 33 years, Maureen Coleman of Jasper, son Chris Coleman and wife Debbie of Jasper, daughters Kathy Sladen and husband Bobby of Midlothian, Stephanie Stephen and husband Alan of Leander, brother Kenneth Coleman and wife B of Huntsville, grandchildren Sonny Stevens, husband Eric Lindsay Stubbe, husband Jason Blake Coleman, wife Lori Jacob Coleman, Alex Coleman, wife Elsie McKenzie Barger, John Michael Barger and Sean Barger, as well as great-grandchildren Caden Stubbe, Emma Coleman, Addison Stubbe, Riley Coleman, and Ellie Stevens. He's preceded in death by his brother Doyle Ray Coleman and Howell Dean Coleman. May we pray together. Almighty God, 
we have come into your presence today and into the presence of one another in the scene of a mystery. For your word tells us that you are almighty. And yet we see pointedly today that death makes a powerful statement. Your word is very clear. Your word says to us that you are the resurrection and the life. And that those who believe in you, even if they are dead, yet shall they live. How this happens is simply beyond us. It is that which we affirm by our Christian faith. And as deep as our very soul is, we believe that this is absolute truth. And so with all the confidence in the world, we recognize that the word of death is not the last word, but it is the word of life, the word of resurrection, the word of faith, the word of hope, the word of love. We celebrate these words today as we celebrate the life of a man who lived well among us, who taught us well, who demonstrated so much that a good educator needs to show. We as a community, Lord, are grateful for the life of Dal Coleman. We let him go back to you, Father, with great reservation, and yet at the same time praying that there will be many, even some here, who will pick up the torch of education and of goodness and of respect and live that among us. Help us now, Lord, as we celebrate his life and as we honor his faith and as we give thanks to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And I have the privilege this afternoon <clears throat> to read for you a story, a true story, a fantastic story, a story that touched the heart of Dal Coleman and Maureen. So listen. It was an ordinary day. Yet before this day was over, it would be one of the most extraordinary days I would ever have. Today was the day that I had to go to Livingston to get a shot in my eye. I have wet macular, and every month Maureen drives me to Livingston to get this shot. It's not anything new because I've been doing this every month for about 18 years. There's no cure for this, this eye disease. But the shots slow it down. I normally wear a brace on my leg because I have health issues with my foot. The brace helps me because it keeps me from falling. However, on this day, I decided not to wear the brace. You know how sometimes you just want to see if you can do something? And for me, it was, can I walk without the brace? You tell yourself that you'll be real careful, and you're so sure that you won't fall. I don't know if it's pride or if it's just plain stubbornness, but today I didn't wear the brace. Everything went as it always does. I had my eye exam, I got my shot, and now it's time to go home. The doctor's offices are a really busy place. The parking lot's always full. There's one way to go into the parking area and one way out. People in cars are constantly moving. As I was walking down the ramp which led to the street, Maureen was a few feet in front of me so she could open the car door for me to get in. Suddenly, I fell. I ended up on my back. I called out to Maureen and she came running back to me it's strange how women can come with so many questions when you're hurt. <clears throat> Did I hit my head? Can you move your arms? Is your back hurt? It's like a machine gun shooting a thousand rounds. 
All the while she's asking these questions, she's looking everywhere for someone to help. She helps me sit up and continues to see if someone, anyone, was coming or going into the building or if any cars are moving. No one. She couldn't leave me to run get help because I was in the street. Realizing there is no one, she says, I'll help you get up. How, I said. You can't get me up. You're not strong enough. Then she said, God, help me. When she said that, suddenly there were two feet right by me. She looked up, and there stood a young African-American man who she said looked like a weightlifter. Needless to say, she was confused. Where did this man come from? Both of us at the same time said, could you please help us? He replied, yes. He started to reach for my right arm, and Maureen asked him to please use my left arm instead because I was scheduled to have rotator cuff surgery on that arm. I couldn't see his face as he passed in front of me to go to the other side. Maureen figured she could help get me up by pushing on my back, so she went to the right side to help. The man simply said, tell me when you're ready. I said, I'm ready. And in a split second, I was standing straight up. I must tell you that to this day, I do not remember the man touching my arm. And Maureen later told me she didn't even have a chance to place her hand on my back. I said to him, this, this is what happens when you get old. And he replied, I understand. And when I turned to look at him, he was gone. I asked Maureen, where did he go? She was looking all around. I, I don't know. His words kept echoing. I understand. The most amazing thing was, no one was still coming in or going out of the buildings, and there still were not any cars moving. She helped me to the car and proceeded to drive out of the parking lot, and suddenly she looked back in her rear view, rear view mirror and she saw cars moving and people walk, walking out of the building. She finally said, Dal, do you believe in angels? And I replied, yes, yes I do. Maybe no one else was supposed to see this man who looked like a weightlifter. Maybe all he was supposed to do was to stand me up. Maybe everything did, did not move because God stopped time when a voice cried, God, help me. I don't know why this happened to me, but I know that I have to tell this story. I know that there was an angel there to help us. And now, I'm telling you, just believe. We're going to sing again. And this song says... Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I don't know everyone in this room, but I'm willing to say that we all need to say those words. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's stand and sing. God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to love, heal and forgive, He bled and died to buy my pardon, an empty 
empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know Holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He reigns. And because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Well, thank you all for being here today. I, uh, we are. Uh, we are very happy you're here, and um, not sure that Dad would be comfortable in this situation to be with us with you. He would uh, he would probably run from this if at all possible. Um, he was a man of few words and few emotions on the surface, but he would be very appreciative of you being here. The story that Woody told is one that he's told us many times, and just kind of gives you an idea about where Dad was at that time in his life. Dad was, uh, was uh, it really typified his story. He, he was not a regular attender of church. He didn't go very often, and when he did, it was usually for a special occasion, for one of the kids or whatever, one of us. Um, and he was not one who had deep religious conversations. But, you know, he believed in what he believed and in what he experienced. And... To me, a man of God is a man who lives it every day, and he did. So the angel story was important to all of us. He was a man of character. Thanks for the applause. <laughs> Hold till the jokes, please, though. He was a man of character, steadfast in his beliefs, and he stood unwavering behind them. He taught us to stand up and be counted on when you were called upon to make a decision. And then stand by it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> he didn't have to preach it. He lived it. Dad was tough but fair. Those of you who worked with him or around him knew that to be the gospel. Uh, so much so that when he was a principal at Jasper High School, this is a great story, a lot of you, some of you might have been there to plant the sign. The sign said, Dalcatraz. <laughs> 
true story. I'm not asking for volunteers if you were part of that, but secretly he loved that. So uh, he took great pride in the discipline and the, the standards that he established at that school. And I think at the time, too, the community, in a time where conservative values and values of discipline and what you're supposed to do and what your children and how they're supposed to act really supported that and believed in that. Dad had great support because of that. And he was eternally grateful. His loyalty to Jasper ISD stemmed from that. Because what he's established and what he did and what he did for this community and the kids, and the kids who came through Dalcatraz was lasting. Some of you are here. You know, you're, some of the parents are here. So what he did has had an eternal effect. Dad's leadership was equal and to all and no meant no to everyone until the arrival of grandchildren <laughs> and great-grandchildren. And of course, all bets are off. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm kind of breaking script here. Excuse me, those of you who know me, I'll break script, script pretty often. But uh, one story, and this goes back, and, and please, I'm just sharing stories of, of, of mine, but my sisters, Kathy and Stephanie, can, can give the same exact same stories from a different angle, but these are just our experiences. So Debbie and I just had our first, first son, Blake. He was probably a year or so old, and Dad was actually before he married Reen. So it's the first time away overnight, one night, okay? So Blake's one, years old, one year old, and we are just trying like the devil to keep him from jumping on the couch and opening the refrigerator and touching everything in the refrigerator. You know, it was, it was cool. Yeah, get out of it, stop. Do. So we take him to Dad's house, first night, okay? We haven't been away from him. We get back the next day. Hey, how did everything go? Great, great, great. What do we know? Refrigerator wide open. He's touching everything in the refrigerator. Blake is. I said, Blake, don't stop it. He says, hey, he's at my house. <laughs> next thing, he's jumping on the couch. Well, no, stop it. He's at my house. So grandbabies could, could get away with everything. Talking about a tight ship, um, Maureen and Dad married and Maureen was his school secretary. So dad was well known as uh, someone that time, 715 was 715, right James? <laughs> and so if you were late, you were late. So he and Maureen were married, still principal, secretary. She gets to school five minutes late. And he asked her, he says, uh, what time are you supposed to be here? <laughs> she said 740. He said, what time is it? She says, it's uh, 7.45. So he writes her up. <laughs> True story, isn't it? It was the same for everybody. But that was dead. I mean, you knew what you got. You knew what you got when you walked in the door. You knew what you were going to get 10 days later. You know what you're going to get 10 years later. That's what it was. But those are the things that we can all learn from. The things that you, you stay consistent, you stay who you are, you stay true to your values and your beliefs, and you do the things day in and day out that people respect you for. And that was the thing that he taught us, you know. All the things he loved, that, Dad loved many, a number of things. And I could probably spend two days, Bubba and I were talking about this, Bubba Mix and I were talking about this yesterday, and uh, he was an unbelievable practical joke player. Probably... 80% of you have probably here have maybe either been a part of that, been joked on, or known about his practical jokes. And anybody at any time could feel the wrath of Dad's practical joke. One story, again, from Reen. Sorry, Reen. 33 years. You've, you've endured a lot of jokes. I'm sorry. They were in a restaurant. had breakfast one morning. And so Reen goes to the restroom to go wash her hands, and she comes back. And while she's gone, Dad tells the waitress she's hard of hearing and has to read lips. <laughs> Serene comes back, sits down. The waitress says, uh, what would you like to eat? She knew right then what had happened. <laughs> Only dad. Another story, uh, and he, of course, Jasper ISD took the brunt of his, of his practical jokes. He used to work at the Department of Instruction. And I'm sorry, Janice Mixon, I know you're here somewhere. This is a, this is a story relayed to me by your loving husband. 
Um, when Dad worked at Department of Instruction, there was a group of ladies there every day, and he would walk in, and he could just be as straight face as, as he could be and walk in, and he'd walk right past this group of ladies and go, wow, that's the biggest scratch I've ever seen on a car, and just keep going. <laughs> well, of course, they'd run out, whose car, whose car? And he did it time and time and time again. So they thought, we are going to get him back. We're not moving this time. So, of course, another time he walks through there, he says, boy, that's the biggest scratch I've ever seen on a car. I just keep walking. They just said, we're going to wait till he leaves. Of course they wait till he leaves. And then they go out. You got to check. <laughs> but probably the best one, and I say the best one, there are many out there. One of the best ones is when the trickster got tricked. The only time I think that I've ever witnessed Dad getting the wool pull over his eyes. It was at Christmas. We had a tradition in our family that on Christmas we would pass out scratch-offs and everybody would get their own scratch-off and scratch it off and all that stuff. And Oh, I got three dollars and I got two. Oh, I got a zonker, you know, whatever. So Debbie found, uh, my wife Debbie found a trick scratch-off that had a $10,000 prize. So we're all standing there in the house and we all have our scratch-offs and oh, I got two. Oh, I didn't get anything and he's over there and everybody's in on it. So we're all going, you know, just watching him and watching him, and he goes, hey, 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 I got, hey, hey, I got a big one, I got a big one, and we're, whoa, dad, that's good, hey, 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 bud, hey, hey, let me tell you, hey, hey, I got a big one right here, well, what, 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 what is it, dad, look, let's look on the back, how do you get the money, you turn the back, he goes, well, number one, it says, uh, go to your local re redemption center, okay, okay, well, what else does it say, number two, Tell your mama you've been tricked. <laughs> of course, in typical dad fashion, he goes, Hey, I gotta give me some of those. <laughs> but dad loved a number of things. Um, he loved because he had such an unbelievable work ethic. He loved people with a work ethic. And he'd say, Hey, bud, hey, hey, let me tell you something. Hey. He's a worker. Well, that meant you got the highest praise Dow Coleman could ever give you, is that you were a worker. So if you got that, then you were in tall cotton. And for years, he and Sweet Olson and Bubba Mixon worked for Temple East Texas in the summers and on weekends for fun. For fun, all right? So they're out doing that. And those times were probably some of the most memorable for Dad because he was with his friends doing the things that he loved the most. And working in the woods, building fence, doing things for Temple East Texas. And, and those are the things that he enjoyed more than anything. Uh, Bubba, thank you for that friendship. And for his brother from another mother, James Adams, thank you for the friendship. Your old running buddy with Jasper ISD and his backup. Funny story, James, you mind if I... No, I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask you. So James and Dad were running buddies. Dad was retired and came back as a retuant officer, as, as was mentioned. We always accused him of wanting to be a cop anyway, so this was just right in his wheelhouse. So they would go out, and Dad had to go out in some really sketchy areas at times to, to deliver, you know, uh, the information that your kids are going to court. And James and Dad, James was older, James had bad knees, and so they'd drive up there, and James told me, he said, hey, listen, bud, I, I, I'm just going to go with your daddy. He says, I'm just going to get out of the truck and stand next to him to see a big black man out there that looks like he's, that I'm security, and that way don't mess with your daddy. He loved you guys, and thank you for that friendship. And Dad loved the beach house. Man, oh man, did he love that beach house. It was a place that provided him 33 years, excuse me, 35 years of unadulterated fun and pleasure and relaxation. He, uh, he shared it with us. And it was his safe haven. And as the years went on, It was increasingly difficult for him to get there and get up the stairs. But our family came through. 
and said, we're going to give you that lift even though you don't want it and say you're not going to need it and you don't need it. The family came through and said, hey, you're Dow Coleman's family. We're stubborn too. So we got the lift. And he said, well, okay, well, okay, well, I'll do it, but uh, I'm only doing it for Ring because she needs it for the suitcases and, and the groceries. <laughs> Typical dad. And then when he finally agreed to it and it got installed, he goes, hey, 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 now, listen, let me tell you something, bud. This is what's going to happen here. Uh, we're not going to use it for frivolous activities. It, it's, only, it's only for necessary. Okay, dad, so the first day you go down there and use it. Who rides it up first? Dad and great-grandchildren. <laughs> but that's dad. You know, and he loved the beach house and he loved to share it and that was his, like I said, his safe haven. And he loved that yard. Oh my gosh, talk about the yard. He loved the yard and stories all over the place. But I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you a couple. One time Ring calls me and says, uh, and, my, and here's the deal. It, it was mentioned that dad had eye shots and he had macular degeneration and so he was losing his eyesight and he couldn't see very far. But he could see from sitting on that back porch, every leaf, every limb, every blade of grass was out of place. And he'd just say, hey, uh, hey, right left, just a little. So Reen calls me one day and says, hey, I, I need your help. I said, what's wrong? I said, well, your daddy, he needs a, he needs a bush trimmed and I can't get up, up there. So I'll go over to the house and I get there and I said, dad, you, so you sit on the porch, you get, yeah, but right there, just, you know, just do it the way you want to. Uh, <laughs> That was a trap. <laughs> so um, he, uh, he said, I said, okay, well, right here. So I'm, I'm reaching up like this. I'm on a little stool and up tall, that little tall slender thing. I said, right here, Dad, you get just th that one right there. And I go, right here. No, no, that one right there. So I go, right here. No, a little bit lower. A little bit lower. A little bit higher. Yeah. Right there. Boom. And I clipped off that much. And now, could you get that one on the other side? <laughs> but the thing about that is, and we laugh about it, is that pride meant a lot to him. He was proud of everything that he did. And he instilled that in us and told us that, listen, you, if you can't do anything right, I mean, be proud of what you do. Do the best you can. And then again, be proud of it. Live by it. And that's what, that's what Dad did. But and I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Dad, Dad was never one to... Uh, to really volunteer advice, but he was always there to help us. And, and I, I kind of go back to uh, a story again. Dad was a basketball coach years ago. And so early in my coaching, I coached basketball early in my career, and we were at a playoff game one time a number of years ago in, in Houston. And he never, Dad, Dad forgot more basketball than I would ever know in my lifetime, okay? That's how, and he never volunteered to say, hey, bud, what are you, Hey, what about doing this or doing that? Never said that. Never volunteered. And I would have taken it gladly. But one night we were down in Houston. And he never said anything. Never said anything about games. Never whatever. Hey, bud, good game. Or that's about it. And we were playing the number one team in the state. And we're ahead. And it's close to the game. It's a playoff game. Huge game. And we call it time. It was a timeout. So I have the timeout. And, and the kids are walking out on the floor. And one player was telling another player, kind of, here's what I need you, you know, here's what, whatever. He's giving him some advice. So I'm out there, and I'm turning, and all of a sudden I hear, hey, 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 bud. <laughs> I recognize his voice. And I turn around, and he goes, hey, bud, you got six on the floor. You got six on the floor. I'm saying, who are you? <laughs> but again, dad was doing what he had to do. It was out of character. But by golly, he wasn't going to let me fail. He was going to be there. Speaking of being there, what time do we play? Do we have the church all day? Got it all okay. Day. I preach a long time too, brother. You should go on. You might take me in on the Baptist ministry if I keep going? Okay. Uh, but talking about basketball... Dad and I used to have, uh, Dad taught me a lot about basketball. We played basketball a lot up, up at the gym and in the back yard. He built, built me a big basketball goal in the, in the driveway. And Dad was a, a tremendous basketball player, tremendous athlete. Played football and basketball at Victoria Junior College. Was a tremendous basketball player at East Texas Baptist. And in the Army, traveled all over the country playing basketball in the Army. He was that good that they recruited him to play. So he, he did a lot of things. And so 
Um, but he also taught me to, how to compete and how to lose because, uh, I mean, there was no winning on my end unless I actually won. And so one day when I was a freshman in high school, about when I was a freshman in high school, I was actually winning, all right, in the backyard. And then things got serious. And so when things got serious, somehow I got a little cut over the eye, you know, a little cut right here. And so um, we go inside, and he's putting a butterfly bandage on it, and he goes, just don't say anything to your mother. <laughs> and we go back out and finish, and I don't know if he just felt sorry for me and let me win or if I actually won, but he taught me a lesson right there is, regardless of what happens, you just keep fighting, keep plugging, keep going, and do the best you can. And, it, you know, looking back at it, and I wear the scar now with, with honor, you know, uh, it's, it's one of those things that I was just showing the boys today about the scar. Talking about love, he loved his brothers. He loved his brothers. The four of them, man, when they got together, cousins, you know what I'm talking about, that was a wild thing. They loved each other. They competed. They gave each other grief unmercifully, but at the same time, they were at each other's side all the time. There was no question. When one was down, the other three were coming. He taught us that family was important. They taught us that you can be loved and love and do that without it being boastful, that it's about being by each other's side when you need it. And being there forever. And be careful when you go with them to the beach house, because I've done that before. And you, you're the one that takes the brunt, because the brothers were together regardless. And they tease you unmercifully, but they loved you to no end. But what Dad loved the most was Maureen. Reen, you made his life amazing. Lavina's travel buddy, his beach buddy, his work buddy, buddy, especially when no one else could keep up, his cooking buddy, his grandchildren buddy, and his greatest fan. You nurtured him, nursed him, fed him, and somehow kept him in line, kind of. <laughs> Most of all, you made his time with you the very best of his life. There's a very special place for you in heaven. Thanks for being so wonderful. I'm going to be honest with you today. I, I, I wrote this down just for a couple reasons. Uh, first, the emotions of the day. You, you kind of lose track of time and in, in what's going on and, and trying to find your place and getting the message across. And the second thing is I kind of need to know when to stop because I could go a long time talking about my dad uh, because he's worth it. But the greatest lessons that we could, we could all learn from dad is that he taught us how to be tough, be resilient, be diligent, and love deeply. We learn that not everyone will understand your actions, but to stay strong in your convictions. People may not always agree, but they will hopefully respect your stance. His best work as a father was when things were at their most difficult. He was a man of few words when it came to his emotions, but his actions spoke volumes. It only took a phone call or a dip of the head in sadness. Dad, excuse me, and Dad sprang into action. Never taking no for an answer when he offered his assistance, especially in times when any of us were in need. We have all experienced times when, which seemed too overwhelming to imagine a positive outcome. But we have persevered by the grace of God and the example that Dad has established for us. His everlasting example to us is to stand up in the face of adversity so those who count on us the most can count on us at any time. I think of no greater example of a man of God than the dad who taught us these lessons. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Chris, for sharing with us your father's story. Well done. There are several objectives for every Christian celebration of life. We want to celebrate the life of the one we're remembering. We want to find comfort in our grief. We want to know where we can find hope for our lives. And so Chris has led us in this celebration of life for Dal Coleman. So again, thank you, Chris, and thank you, family, for sharing the angel story with us. In so many ways, Dal Coleman lived a remarkable life. It's rare to find a life that has made such an impact on a community. Fifty-four years in our local school system is pretty much unparalleled. I've heard more people speak to the way Dal Coleman treated students with respect and with fairness. His strong discipline launched thousands of students into good and productive lives. In fact, there are probably a good number of you here today who received a swat or two from Dal Coleman. Did you ever get one of those, Maureen? <laughs> this was his attempt not only to educate you, but to help you be good people. People who knew Dal best spoke of his faith, as Chris has done, and how he shared that faith with his family. And his family tells me that he was an excellent father and grandfather. He knew right from wrong, and there was no gray area. After five years of dating and 37 years of marriage, 33 years of marriage, Maureen tells me he was a great man, and we had a wonderful life together. I know we are not ready for that wonderful life to come to an end, but we can take comfort today in a life well lived. But where do we find comfort at times like this? Certainly in our memories of that life well lived. But believers find comfort in the scripture that for over 3,000 years has spoken to us. Right about 3,000 years ago, a shepherd king wrote these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Thou art with me, Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Or how about these words from the Apostle Paul, who lived about 2,000 years ago and wrote these words, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. <laughs> no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, or depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And finally, the very words of Jesus himself who spoke these things just before he faced his cross. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in me, believe also in God. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, Jesus said, there you may be also. And where do we find hope? Well, we are not like those who have no hope, 1 Thessalonians 4 says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul wrote about what some have called the Trinity of Graces. He said, now faith and hope and love, these three abide. <laughs> but the greatest of these is love. 
Let me tell you what we mean when we speak about faith. Christians tell a story, especially at this time of year. The short version of that story is that God is real, and He created all that is. And God intended His creation, especially humans, to live in a love relationship with Him. But humans turned to themselves and turned away from Him. God never stopped seeking to draw humankind back into His love relationship. 2,000 years ago, God became a human in Jesus. Because of sin, He died on a Roman cross, buried, yet God raised Him to life. And He still lives today. Christians actually believe this story. We believe it's true. And these Christians give their lives to follow Jesus. And that's what the Bible means when it speaks about faith. May I tell you part of what we mean by hope? A large part of humankind today live with no real hope that tomorrow will be better than today. And even worse than that, they have no hope that eternity will be just or that they will be safe in eternity. But the Christian act of faith in Jesus gives the Christian confident hope that God is just and He will bring final justice to all things and He will secure the believer in His presence for eternity. That is what the Bible ultimately means by hope. And let me tell you what we mean by love. Paul concluded his trinity of graces with the assertion that the greatest of these is love Paul's word for love is godly love, unconditional love, a love that transformed the life of the beloved. This love is where faith and hope find their end. Believers, none of whom are perfect, I am not, you are not, Tao was not, yet believers find unconditional, life-transforming love given to them by the God who is majestic over all. It's an amazing truth. The great God of the universe cares for persons like me, like us, and forever desires an eternal love relationship with us. Oh, it's simply amazing. In the end, it's not one's commitment to go to church, Chris, nor is it religious ritual that we participate in that make the final eternal difference. It is faith that the God who came to us in Christ Jesus, the baby in the manger, that He will save the life of all who believe. That's why I speak with the confidence of this family that Dal Coleman is one of these. We find great comfort and strength in that. Perhaps it's a fitting metaphor to think about an educator as a shepherd. Isn't that what a good educator really does? He or she instructs students and informs their minds about math and science and history and language and art, but in a much greater sense. The real educator shepherds life as much as he informs the mind. Dal Coleman was a shepherd of lives. For 54 years, he guided and informed and instructed and shaped the lives of our children. He was one of the great shepherds of our community. So on behalf of this community, I say, thank you, sir. And it is most fitting to know that this shepherd of our community bowed his knee to the great shepherd and lived his life with this truth. The Lord is my shepherd. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, 
we have assembled today to honor you. We have come together as a community, men and women who have been educated by Dow Coleman, loved, disciplined, encouraged, men and women who saw within D-Daddy, who saw within this husband, this father, this grandfather, this great-grandfather, this principal, this teacher, this coach. We saw a man who lived in strength, a man who lived with conviction, a man who, by all evidence, bowed his knee to you. We thank you for him. And we ask, Lord, that we honor his memory by living with this kind of integrity and with this kind of fairness and justice and sense of right and wrong. It would be an honor to his memory if we were these kind of people. Lord, we've also come to you, gracious God, for encouragement for help, for strength. Your word tells us that you will never leave us or forsake us. And we believe that. Your word also tells us, as was printed in the program, that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. And that's hard sometimes to see, but because we know you, Lord God, gracious Father. Because we know you, we believe these words are true. And so, may we live the days ahead, Lord, knowing your comfort and your presence and your encouragement. May we live these days ahead, lift, lifting one another up and helping each other out of this love relationship that we have with one another. And may we live the days ahead, inspired by the life of a man who lived in this community almost all of his life and shepherded us in so many ways. How thankful we are, how humbled we are, how gracious we are to you. Lord, would you be the strength that Maureen needs, and Chris, and Kathy, and Stephanie, and all this family. We place ourselves in your hands, gracious God, for there's where we are safe, there's where we are secure now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.